Now listen, I'm a DS9 head. I have always been a DS9 head. It is my jam. But All Good Things is the best finale of any of the Star Treks to date. There's no arguing it. It's perfect. It is stunning. So let's have a look and see how much of what was predicted actually panned out. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here is Star Trek All Good Things, Reality versus Fiction. Number 11, the uniforms. So if you think of the uniforms that were introduced in All Good Things, we go back to uh, block color. I say go back to in Next Generation, of course, we, we stay with the block color. We lose the black stripe across the top. And instead, it's a tunic that resembles in a way the monster maroons of the Wrath of Khan era. Red for command, you've got gold for ops and security, and you've got blue for the sciences. It's, it's actually quite a really nice uniform. And unfortunately, going forward to Picard, it's not the uniform they ended up going with. In Picard, there was actually two different variations on the uniforms of the future. The first is its stripes and colors with your standard pips and of course the traditional com badge. And then later on, it actually seems to go back slightly to the early DS9 and Voyager era, except they've got the cool little arrowhead stitched into the shoulders as well. They're, they're both quite nice, with the earlier of the two actually being the stronger of the two, in my opinion. The All Good Things uniform seems to be relegated to alternate futures only, because it turned up in the Visitor episode of Deep Space Nine, where we see Captain Nog, and of course Bashir and Dax wearing it. A very alive Jadzia Dax, I should say. And also Voyager Endgame, Admiral Janeway wears almost exactly the same uniform as Captain Beverly Picard, except with the gold piping of an admiral. Number 10, the Romulan Empire. This one, All Good Things, might have got right, actually. So in All Good Things, the former crew of the USS Enterprise, they travel to the neutral zone, to the Devron system, to investigate where Picard says there's going to be a temporal anomaly, or there should be a temporal anomaly. They managed to book passage above the uh, USS Pasteur, captained by Captain Beverly Picard. It flies out to the Devron system, and in the neutral zone, the Klingons appear, because the Romulan Empire has fallen and been taken over by the Klingons in this version of the future. Now, in Star Trek Picard, and actually introduced in 2009's Star Trek, the Romulan supernova destroys the Romulan solar system, and with it completely throws the Empire into chaos. So, in a way, All Good Things actually predicted the fall of the Romulan Empire. They might have gone so differently, but they never actually explained the reason why the Empire fell in All Good Things. Who's to say there wasn't a supernova? Number nine, the Kittimer Accords. In All Good Things, the peace treaty between the Federation and the Klingon Empire has ended. The USS Pastor is ambushed and attacked by two Nagvar-class vessels, which are introduced in this uh, end of the next generation. They are a beautiful design, absolutely stunning. They paste the USS Pasteur, which of course is only a hospital ship. Now then, there's no more Treaty of Algeron because the Romulan Empire has fallen. The Enterprise D with three nacelles decloaks and makes very short work of the Nagvar class. But one thing is very, very true. The Klingons of the Federation are no longer friends. So what happened in the main series? Well, things may have started going in that direction. Season four of Star Trek Deep Space Nine was the season where, in the words of Iris Stephen Bear, the Klingons go nuts because they were riled and fueled by a changeling infiltrator in the shape of General Martok, who arrives in the Nagvar, brought into Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and proceeds to invade Cardassia, and when Gowron arrives, tears up the Kittimer Accords. While this is a slightly shorter falling out between the two. The Klingons have yet to make an appearance in Star Trek Picard. As it stands, so we don't know what relations the Federation and the Klingons have. The lack of the Romulan Empire is a factor at the end of all good things. 
So where do these two great powers stand at the moment? Number eight, the Enterprise D. All good things gives us the beautiful three nacelled, subsequently called Dreadnought class Enterprise D. Both a radical redesign of the ship while also not being that radical, it, it, it kept the original design. It effectively slapped a few extra bits on. This improved its warp efficiency. It was able to reach higher speeds. Not the theoretical warp 10, but they've obviously redesigned the warp scale by the time we get to the future of all good things. Admiral Riker commandeers the ship, well, takes control of the ship, I should say, and flies it out to the Devron system and thankfully saves the crew of the Pastor. That's not what happened. Because in reality, cinema came along. It was the rigours of filming that model when it came to Star Trek Generations that sealed the Enterprise D's fate. Unfortunately, they went the wrong side of a Klingon bird of prey in orbit of Viridian 3, who managed to get straight through their shields thanks to Geordi's visor. God damn you, Geordi. And destroy the beautiful Galaxy-class Enterprise D. Now, we were graced with the wonderful saucer separation and crash sequence, there is a silver lining, and that silver lining is the Sovereign class Enterprise E, introduced in Star Trek First Contact and became every single Trekkie's Christmas wish list in 1996. Number seven, Deanna Troy. In the future of all good things, seen missing. In reality, Deanna Troy did not die in the future. There was no wedge driven between Worf and Riker over her death, and she is happily married to William Riker. They have a beautiful daughter, Kestra, and they had a beautiful son, Thad, but unfortunately, Thad passed away. Other than that, they seem to be living quite a happy life, quite a happy retirement, really. They have a beautiful cabin on Nepenthe, and really, it seems like a genuine happy ending after serving for years on the USS Titan as well. Number six, Worf. In All Good Things, Worf has actually become, gone into politics. He's become a governor of the Klingon colony Hatoria. They actually managed to get his help to get across the border into what was the neutral zone and get to the Devron system. Without him, they probably wouldn't have got across. The Pastor was able to get there. Unfortunately, that sort of results in creating the anomaly, but how and ever, this could also still happen. So Worf has not yet appeared in Star Trek Picard. That's fine. If you think of his career trajectory in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, he moves to the station, becomes strategic operations officer, stays there for four years, and is then made the Federation ambassador to Kronos. There is absolutely nothing to say that Worf has not become a governor by the time that Star Trek Picard is appearing. Nemesis, of course, happens after the end of both Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Star Trek Voyager, which sees Worf back in his traditional Starfleet uniform. Now, nothing is said about it, so there's no reason to say that he didn't have a temporary return to the military just for that mission. Hey, Riker did at the end of Star Trek Picard. Number five, Data. He's teaching at Cambridge. He's, 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 he's doing fine. He's doing fine. And he is, of course, the first one to really give weight to Picard's belief that he is moving backward and forward in time. Data, ever the scientist. In reality, there was a stumble along the way. Data was destroyed when the scimitar was destroyed. He sacrificed himself to destroy the Thaleron weapon that Shinzon was going to use to destroy all life on the Enterprise. It was a heroic death, and it was sort of requested by Brent Spiner, who felt he was just getting too old to play the part. Thankfully, when Star Trek Picard rolled around, technology had got to the point where they could convincingly de-age him so that he looked pretty close to what he looked like in Star Trek Nemesis. He was able to have a much better send-off in season one of Star Trek Picard. It was revealed that part of his neural net had effectively been rebuilt from one or two neurons that Bruce Maddox had managed to recover, which was great until you learn that he's effectively been living as a, a sort of a prisoner ghost for 20 years. He does get a beautiful, beautiful denouement between himself and Jean-Luc, and then that 
blue skies scene. There's strong feelings about Star Trek Picard. That one hit me right in the heart. Number four, Geordie LaForge. In All Good Things, Jordy is happy and well, and he has his ocular implants, and he's married to Leah Brahms, which, okay, that's always been a questionable relationship there, but he lives out on the Rigel system. He seems to be doing pretty well for himself, to be honest. He's got a couple of kids, and he just pops by to visit Picard, of course, once he hears that Picard is suffering from Eremotic Syndrome. He ends up becoming the first of the original Enterprise D crew to join Picard on his quest, if you like. In Star Trek Picard, what we know about Geordi, we've actually got from prequel tie-in media. Specifically, Dr. Una McCormick's book, Picard, The Last Best Hope, details that Geordi was very much involved and in charge of the building side of putting together the Romulan relief effort with all of those Wallenberg class ships as well. Spoiler, I guess, but no, thankfully, he was not killed during the synth attack on Mars. He was off world at the time. He is a lucky, lucky man because a lot of people were killed. Now, he has yet to make an appearance in Star Trek Picard, but there is strong indications that he will appear in season two of the show. Number three, Beverly Crusher. In All Good Things, Beverly Picard, nay Crusher, is captain of the USS Pasteur, a hospital ship of Olympic class, which is based on the design of the old Daedalus class ships. Herself and Jean-Luc obviously married, but they amicably separated to the point where, you know, thankfully some of the greatest tension between them is, do we shake hands or do we give each other a hug? It's really heartwarming. There is a moment where Picard, Jean-Luc Picard, definitely oversteps on the bridge of her ship. He recognizes what he did. He had to be challenged, but he recognized what he did and he apologized, rightfully so. There is no character that has been done dirty in the, you know, the continuing Next Generation adventures as Beverly Crusher. In the movies, she very quickly became a supporting character down to, I don't know, what's below supporting. She's not in Generations very much, she is quite cool in Star Trek First Contact, doesn't have an awful lot to do, uh, is barely in Insurrection. She gets to fire a phaser rifle, that's pretty cool. Yes, yeah, she's in Nemesis until she isn't. She just vanishes at the end of Nemesis. A deleted scene thankfully puts her back in as having headed up Starfleet Medical, which was the excuse given for her disappearance in season two of The Next Generation as well. The extended universe, the novels, have her still married happily to Picard. Obviously, that's not the route that the, that the show has taken. So she needs to appear in season two of Star Trek Picard and not in a hi, I'm data, I'm dead now kind of way. Either have her as a recurring character or just, just let us know. Let us know what's going on with Dr. Crusher because otherwise, she is the one member of the crew where, what happened to her? Number two, William T. Riker. In All Good Things, Riker has become an admiral. So he's got the cool admiral jacket and he's got the cool silver fox hair and beard and he's looking pretty well. He's looking a bit fed up with Jean-Luc's nonsense because he's become a desk man. He's not quite the Riker that we remember from the next generation. He is not the sort of dashing ladies man, kind of Kirk with a conscience. Even when he does rescue the crew by getting the old Enterprise D out of retirement, he is still, he's, he's not a very nice man, really. But it only takes meeting his old crew to sort of reawaken his adventurous spirit again. It's very refreshing to see. So what happens in reality? Well, it's actually a bit of a happier ending there. So we know that he leaves the Enterprise E to go and captain the USS Titan. The Titan encounters the USS Cerritos and rescues them from the pack leads and nicks one of their crew when Boimler goes over as a Lieutenant Junior Grade. Himself and Deanna, they retire to Nepenthe with their beautiful daughter Kestra and there he remains until one day Jean-Luc Picard walks up to his front door looking for help. 
Ring Starfleet Command gets himself reinstated and as an acting captain shows up on the USS Zheng He along with 200 other Inquiry class starships and saves the day for Picard and the La Serena. It was a cool moment. It was a very cool moment at the end of Picard to see him turn up again and just be the Riker that we remember. Number one, Jean-Luc Picard. Jean-Luc Picard of all good things has clearly begun to become affected by his aromatic syndrome, but there really is a sense of disorientation with Q moving him backward and forward in time. Yeah, fair enough. I think I'd be bothered as well by that. He is thrown off balance and he has to go through the motions of explaining what's happening to his old crewmates and trying to get them to believe. He does, however, still have that scientific mind. And if it wasn't for that, there could have been trouble because if he hadn't realized the paradox of moving backward and forward through time, that the anomaly gets bigger the further back in time it goes, who's to say what happened to humanity? Now, in Star Trek Picard, the season one opens with the revelation that, yes, Aeromotic Syndrome is setting in and he is beginning to feel the effects of it. He is very clearly a different man from the one we left on the bridge of the USS Enterprise E at the end of Star Trek Nemesis. But think of how much loss he's been through. The entire Mars attack, the Romulan relief effort basically going up in smoke. He shut himself away. He, you know, he cut himself off from the world and he went back to his vineyard in France which is where we met him when Geordi walked up to him in Q's future. Quite frankly, it's nearly a match. So in that respect, all good things nailed it. That's everything for our list today, guys. If you think we missed anything, please drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick as well. Now, whether you are facing the twilight of your year, oh no, hang on, you're in your prime. Oh wait, no, hang on, you're back in your youth again. Wherever you are, have fun, look after yourself, look after your friends and family, just generally be a nice person, and live long and prosper.